Welcome to lesson number two on Frankenstein. Today we're going to look at Walton's letters, all four of them. Make sure you've read them before we press on. If you have, let's go. So Mary Shelley begins her gothic novel Frankenstein not with the story of the eponymous character he's introduced later. Instead, we get Captain Walton, an Arctic explorer, who introduces himself with these words. In letter one, he says, You cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries, to reach which at present so many months are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be effected by an undertaking such as mine. It is clear that here is a character who seeks fame. He's going to do something that confers, gives a benefit to all of mankind, to the last generation. He wants to go down in history, and the way he's going to do it is by discovering a passage near the Pole. That's the North Pole, and in creating this setting, creating this character, Mary Shelley is referring to basically the space race of the early 19th century, and late 18th century in fact as well. If you were alive in 1815 and opened your newspaper like Mary Shelley did, probably the headline would say, so-and-so gets closer than ever before to the North Pole. That's not Walton's only ambition. He'd be happy to discover any secrets, the secret of the magnet, anything that he can contribute to Enlightenment science. Now, the phrase the secret of the magnet also preempts, foreshadows Victor's later attempt to discover the secret to life, in some ways a far greater Enlightenment discovery. At the end of this quotation, Shelley reveals to us that whilst it might be admirable to strive to achieve these things, there is an arrogance and impetuosity to the Enlightenment scientist and the Enlightenment explorers that she wants us to be wary of. The scenario that we meet Walton in is that he's on his boat, he's travelling up to the Arctic, and pretty soon in the letters we learn that his ship has got stuck in the ice. So he's there, frustrated, unable to get closer to his goal. And he's sending home these letters back to England. Mrs Savile, we discover pretty quickly, is his sister Margaret Walton. Margaret Walton Savile is an interesting nod towards Mary Shelley. Those are her initials, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, uh, her married name. Margaret Walton Savile receives the letters, but interestingly, we never get any sense, of course, of whether she replies, other than the little hints that Walton gives us within his letters, suggesting that some kind of communication has come back from England. So, I think about the logistics of that. How do you get letters off a ship that's stuck in the ice back to England? There's something a little bit magical realist about that, a little bit willing suspension of disbelief. We need to believe that these letters get home somehow. Alternatively, of course, there's a much darker, more gothic explanation. Perhaps Walton perished on his boat, his letters never were sent home, uh, in spite of the hints he gives that they were, and they were maybe discovered long after his death. That, of course, would then set up that air of mystery. Recognise two important things about that narrative perspective. One, Women's point of view, women's perspective, is sidelined in the novel from the very word go. They are silenced by the narrative form, which is interesting for Mary Shelley, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, famous feminist writer. Why is she, from the very word go, uh, sidelining women's views in this way? Second important thing to think about this narrative frame is the kind of reliability, or maybe unreliability, that it imbues the whole narrative with from the word go. This is one man's perspective on, as we later discover, another man's perspective, and indeed another creature's perspective after that. So if we're only hearing this one biased point of view, how do we interpret the rest of the novel? Pause and reflect on what we've discussed so far. How many different ways can we interpret Walton's role? You might want to use some of the ideas at the bottom of the screen. As well as representing these big ideas in the novel, Walton's characterisation introduces a number of the key themes and symbols, and we see that in this extract from Letter 2. He tells us, I desire the company of a man who could sympathise with me, whose eyes would reply to mine. You may deem me romantic, my dear sister, but I bitterly feel the want of a friend. 
I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as of a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. How would such a friend repair the faults of your brother? In his desire for the company of a man, Walton's characterisation is foreshadowing Victor's creation of his own doppelganger, his own second, his own mirror image later on in the novel. Intriguingly, Walton uses this word romantic, not perhaps in the most flattering way. In fact, he uses it really as a slur, suggesting that there are weaknesses, feminine characteristics. You're a fantasist, you're illogical if you're romantic, and they're all the things which are anathema to Walton. They are the opposite of one, what he wants to be, the Enlightenment explorer rationally discovering the truth. Later in this extract, he tells us that he seeks to uh, uh, a friend. He seeks a friend to approve or amend his plans. But rather than inviting a friendly critic, what he's really saying is he wants a yes man, someone to prop him up and to agree with him. Now there's something completely anti Enlightenment, anti scientific process about that, and what that leads to is our perception of him as a very faulted moral character. He's hypocritical and doesn't quite seem to recognise his own mind. However, however, he gains a little bit of sympathy from us in recognising that he is faulted. This sets up one of the key ideas later in the novel, that when Frankenstein recognises his own faults, like a Shakespearean tragic hero, we're inclined to forgive him. Pause for your second task. Which key themes are introduced through the characterisation of Walton? Write down as many as you can spot both in that extract and others that have grabbed your attention. Now I've referred to Shakespeare there and this sets us up to have a look at some of the other intertextual references that there are in the opening to Shelley's novel. But in fact, to find the first two, we need to look before the letters even begin. On the very first page of Frankenstein, Shelley includes two really important, really telling references to other texts. The first one is the modern Prometheus. Prometheus was a demigod in Greek mythology who stole fire from the gods and was punished as a result. With this subtitle, Shelley is telling us to be wary of overly ambitious people like Walton and later, as we'll discover, like Frankenstein himself. That is the reason he is the modern Prometheus. The second intertextual reference is, of course, the epigraph, which I'm sure you noticed, from Paradise Lost by John Milton. The words, did I request thee maker from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Now, in that second intertextual reference, um, Paradise Lost is the story of Genesis. It's the retelling of the Adam and Eve narrative. And what Shelley has honed in on there is human beings accusing God of having set them up in a pretty unfair way to commit original sin and be damned ever after. Asking the question, did I request thee to be made? Did I ask? Did I ask you to make me? A bit like the sort of classic teenager saying, "I didn't ask to be born. How can you therefore judge me for being so bad?" Well, this is the role that humans are set up to play in Shelley's novel. In his letters, Walton refers to Paradise Lost as well, using the phrase "the world before you," which is a direct quote from Book Twelve of. 12 of Paradise Lost, which refers to the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they've committed original sin. Another literary allusion that might have passed you by the first time round of reading Walton's letters is his reference to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. In fact, he makes two references. The key one that sets up the allusion is the land of mist and snow. Now, Coleridge's epic poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, includes an episode in which a sailor kills an albatross and is cursed, getting stuck in the ice of the ocean as a result. So there we have Walton drawing a parallel between his situation in the Arctic and Coleridge's cursed mariner. We later hear from Walton, however, how he believes... 
perhaps hubristically, that he is a stronger willed character than Coleridge's narrator because he, and I quote, will kill no albatross. He believes he's going to avoid the same pitfalls that Coleridge's romantic character fell into. Final literary allusions made by Walton are a little bit broader. Um, a niche in the temple where the names of Shakespeare and Homer are consecrated. This is Walton reflecting on his own ambitions to become a poet. He used to have romantic ambitions. Um, maybe he failed at those and has now turned to the Enlightenment instead. This, on the one hand, could be Mary Shelley having a little dig at Enlightenment thinkers who do down the arts and poetry. On the other hand, it could be her suggesting that underneath it all, Walton is still a romantic character who prioritises his own personal feelings. Homer and Shakespeare, both really significant writers in the Western canon, and this in itself is a reference to something that romantic thinkers and people around the early 19th century were really obsessed with, the idea of a pantheon of thinkers and artists and philosophers. And uh, for a in really interesting example of this, you might want to look up Valhalla, that's Val with a W, Valhalla built in Germany in the early 19th century. So with all of these literary allusions embedded in Walton's letters, it's clear that Mary Shelley, for all of his faults as a character, is telling us that he is an intellectual, he's well-read, he's well-educated. In that sense, he's the epitome of the Enlightenment. And it's really interesting now to think about the context of these Arctic explorers that Mary Shelley was inspired by. In 1815, a whaler, William Scoresby, made plans for a sledge expedition towards the North Pole and um, his work was later published in a lecture in 1818 which we think Mary Shelley may well have encountered in which case perhaps William Scoresby is the basis for Walton. Being a whaler of course would introduce this element of a, a certain amorality at the very least if not an immorality in his actions. Mary Shelley condemning the explorers of the Arctic as much as she is kind of excited by the exotic lives that they lead. Pause for task three. How did the context of Arctic exploration inspire Mary Shelley? So those are Walton's letters, and that's our introduction to many of the key themes, key ideas, as he represents, Captain Walton represents, that then continue throughout the novel. He is the character who introduces us to Frankenstein towards the middle of letter four. And in our next lesson, we're going to think then about how the introduction to Frankenstein continues as we meet his family and are later introduced to the scientific exploration that he begins at university. I'll see you then.